Hello everyone, welcome to Hot Seat Season 3. I'm Omid Mohalas joining you from Tehran and once again I'm so grateful and honored to share this educational platform with all of you and I think it's a good opportunity for all of us after COVID that we can, we can sit at home in front of our television or laptop or mobiles and have the chance to learn from the best clinicians and educators from around the world. And I have to say, as I've always said that, I'm so grateful that all these great friends accepting the invitation and joining me and become in your screen uh, available to share their knowledge and their expertise and great clini clinical experiences with you, which definitely help us obtain better knowledge and understanding in treating our patients and achieving the long-term stability of the outcome in our treatments. And today I have a very dear friend joining me from Toronto, Canada. Dr. Phil Walton is here with me. Hello, Phil, and welcome to Hot Seat, my friend. Thank you so much for the quick introduction there. Um, as we were just discussing before, obviously, uh, if there is a silver lining or a unique side to COVID, which I never thought I would say, it gives us this opportunity to really have education kind of at our fingertips. The amount of lectures that I've done or had the ability to access from top clinics from around the world has kind of become you know, un unprecedented. That's not to say that I'm still not jealous of the people who are slowly starting to work back into their normal routines a little bit with vaccines coming through. And uh, hopefully, of course, in the future, I would love to, uh, you know, cross paths and have a chance to actually meet in person. That's about these relationships and interact. Well, I, I thank you for having me. I'm glad I'm included amongst, uh, you know, some of the names that, of course, have been through, through your hot in the past and in the future. It's certainly an honor. Thank you. The pleasure is also mine. And as Phil said, uh, over the past two seasons, we tried to cover almost all aspects uh, in implantology, periodontology, from the surgical point of view, from the prosthetic point of view. Uh, and we go through always the basics first and to the advanced procedures also. But in the third season, we decided to add also case presentations during the uh, hot seat sessions. So we will have it more practical and more uh, understanding during the session. And definitely, as always, we will have a great Q&A at the end. So it will maybe, I'm pretty sure it will answer most of your questions. So before we start, I would like to have Dr. Walton's CV for all of you. And then we will go through the presentation and we will have a discussion at the end. Dr. Walton earned his Doctor of Dental Surgery degree from the University of Toronto prior to pursuit of his, under, of his graduate dental studies, he completed externships at the University of Michigan and overseas at the King's College School of Medicine and Dentistry in London, England. Dr. Walton completed his master's degree in periodontology at Harvard School of Dental Medicine. His practice includes conventional periodontal therapy for tooth maintenance, periodontal plastics, as well as advanced regenerative techniques and implant rehabilitation. His current area of focus lies in immediate implant placement and temporizations for both single, multiple, and full arch reconstruction. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Canada and a US board certified diplomat of periodontics and implantology and maintains an affiliation to University of Toronto and Harvard as a clinical instructor, international research fellow, admissions committee member, and active alumnus. So once again, Phil, I'm so happy to have you, my friend, and the platform is all yours, and we are ready for your beautiful presentation. Of course. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just begin to share my screen. You'll make sure that you've got everything on your end and that it's working, and then we'll, we'll kind of get down to business here. Perfect. All right, are you seeing things? Wonderful. Okay, so you know, if, just before we began, and I think since the since the outset of our discussion, you mentioned about this idea of kind of a case presentation tailored into a topic, and I think that I'll kind of be melding a couple of things here. That you're certainly going to see some some what I think is some valuable case work and really everyday situations. I think your request was an interesting one. You said. 
I want you to do a complicated case or a complex case. And it's funny, when we all look back on our patient care and uh, you know, the, the various challenging or, or more simple cases that we have addressed, I think one thing that I always realize is that sometimes a case that may present as simple can unravel rather quickly if we don't follow biology and certain principles that we all touch on. And when I was thinking of some cases that I really thought were appropriate to be batched together and kind of drove home a point of something I'm kind of passionate about or where I have found to be very difficult, I, I kind of stumbled or, or, or ran into this idea or topic of this parcel edentialism in the aesthetic zone. Um, and I've written here, you know, unique challenges and considerations for whatever that's kind of worth. You know, I think now more than ever, we certainly appreciate that when it comes to implant dentistry, many people may be able to carry out in a very simplified fashion. And when things go well, yes, it's routine. But when we are, are not kind of cognizant of some of these rules or, or, or regulations that kind of you know, govern the way that we should place implants, we may end up in situations that are very hard to rectify. And I think, of course, when we're working in the aesthetic zone, everyone loves to tackle or add that little piece, you know, the aesthetic zone, because it makes it sound like it's, you know, an attractive topic for people to tune into. But I think there is truth to that. I mean, the stakes are definitely higher when we're working in the front of patients' mouths as opposed to the posterior. Not that we don't always try and provide the highest level of care, regardless of the region that we're working in. But yes, we, we have to have that much more attention to detail and things are that much more critical when we're working in this area. So that's why I wanted to touch on this. And, and I, I'll just kind of jump to, to a couple of things. I mean, everyone knows this gentleman, Dr. Dennis Tarnow. And, uh, you know, everyone likes to throw names around as if they personally know the individual. I've seen Den Dennis speak many times over the years. Uh, and what I always find interesting is that depending on where you're at in your kind of lifetime of practicing, I really see that you view things through different lenses. And what I mean by that is when I first thought in my head of what would have been kind of the, the pinnacle of the most challenging cases that someone could undertake when it comes to implant dentistry, I used to think it was the single central incisor. That was my feeling. You know, it, it's one single tooth. It was going to be adjacent to a natural tooth. You know, trying to match that aesthetic must be the most complicated thing. And I don't want to diminish that. But of course, as we work along and we gain experience and, and we see the outcomes over time, I think we realize and appreciate, and certainly what I shed light on today, is that actually single implants have a lot of advantages, whereas multiple implants, which we may think are easier at first because you know, we can have the lab fabricate things out of the same porcelain or ceramic to make the match, they carry their own unique challenges that can really result in less than ideal outcomes. And this quote came from Dennis when I most recently saw him. And, and I'm a big fan of like scribbling things down when I hear what I like, whether it's from a book or, or a show or something. I really do love quotes. And I know it's kind of cliche for people to show this stuff in a, in a lecture, especially if we're just kind of discussing cases. But he said, everyone can't wait to show their single implants. And if this was said to me, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago, it would have gone right over my head or kind of fallen on deaf ears. I wouldn't have understood the gravity to that. But today, after having placed my share of implants and had my own, you know, less than ideal outcomes, you start to realize and appreciate the depth and the merit to what Dennis is saying here. And I think it's become a really hot topic in and of itself to discuss this kind of multiple implant placement because we, we know as, as providers that there are nuances that can exist that, that really, really, uh, you know, must, must, must be obeyed in order to gain kind of solid outcomes. So, you know, when I look at a case like this, and this is not the case that we're going to be discussing today, we're going to get into some nice casework. This is a situation was actually from my residency, a patient who presented to us. And, you know, when you look at this, everyone and their brother wants to put in implants and everyone wants to be the guy who puts in the most implants and do the most volume. But if this patient tells you that they want to go forth and they're in your chair, as we always say, tomorrow morning, this afternoon, you know, what are you actually going to do once they accept treatment? And I think so often we're all so eager to do treatment or we've just learned a new technique or we want to implement implantology in our practices that we might just 
not know where to go from here. And you know, for me, there are different directions you can head. Uh, you know, I, when I poll people or when I show cases like this for discussion, when we have the luxury of in-person kind of interaction, you know, it's amazing to hear the different responses that people will come up to how they will treatment plan this. And for me, you know, one of the options, and I'll go through every permutation, I think one of the commonly accepted ones is to simply put it in the lateral incisor positions and then create like a four unit bridge. And I think this one has slowly kind of risen to the top. But you know, there are other permutations that can exist and may be viable, and we need to understand the pros and cons. For instance, could you put two implants in the centrals and why would you do that? Uh, oftentimes when I discuss this with people, they're quick to say, oh, the centrals are a great location. You know, I, I've even had students say to me that, that putting two implants beside each other is actually better for papilla formation or for bone reconstruction or maintenance, which you know is certainly not necessarily the case, but we have to appreciate that there are different ideas. Some have said, well, you could put centrals if there was existing teeth there or the bone wasn't atrophic. I mean, there are no strict rules, but there are certainly guidelines or parameters that we want to work within. Um, you know, how about putting four dental implants? I, often people will joke, you know, about over-engineering or the only reason someone would do this is because, uh, you know, the, the dentist wants to make more money. And, uh, you know, th for me, there are very few uh, reasons for putting four implants in this kind of a situation, barring that the patient has, you know, really robust bone or adequate space in order to keep inter-implant distances. But even more so than that, uh, you know, the only one that kind of stumbles upon for me is that I have had individuals who come in really wanting single entities for their implants because they, they were former bridge wearers and they don't want the bridge. That's one of the few times. But, you know, this comes with challenges. And, and I'm going to take you through a case very similar to this later on. But I just wanted to set the stage. The funny thing is that I was just on Instagram recently and... Um, I think you actually had had him or are having him, Ramon, um, who's one of the most talented clinicians. He showed he actually did one in the lateral and one in the central. So I thought I had covered every single permutation, but actually, you know, there are situations where we kind of get creative due to certain circumstances with the bone, with uh, you know, infection, with the patient's aesthetics and things like this. So, you know, I, this is what I kind of favor, this lateral incisor position. I'm sure this can make for a decent discussion at the end because everyone has their kind of preferences, but keep that in mind at least going forward. And, you know, it all comes down to this kind of situation where we need to know, I think, how much space is considered okay or allowed between implants or between implants and teeth because those kind of governance are going to kind of make way for us. And, and when we show this image, I think so many people, uh, you know, especially as dentists or as dental students, were fantastic at memorizing things. And we, we love having these hard, fast rules. So we know that we should have at least a few millimeters, typically people say, between two implants and at least a millimeter and a half between an implant and a tooth. But do we know why we do that? You know, I mean, that, that is a big thing for me. And it really comes down to this idea of, kind of, you know, biologic width formation or this kind of circumferential amount of bone loss that, that can ensue after we place a dental implant. And, you know, so many implant companies boast that their implants have crestal stability or they do not lose any bone. But I think anyone who has placed their share of implants knows that we try our best to mitigate this, but it can still happen happen from time to time, and it can still be totally aesthetic and okay from a health standpoint. But really what we're looking at is, is this kind of formation of this biologic width that we know is, is something that takes place regardless of platform switch, regardless of many other efforts that we put forth surgically and from a production line standpoint. So, I mean, you know, here I've called it biologic width and just in updating things, if we want to go by the new AAP kind of, uh, you know, classification that no one loves, we're now calling it super crest attachment. So, you know, when we look at this, and, and I hate to put this up, but I need to just bear on it for just one second. We all know that there's this difference between peri-implant tissue and a natural tooth, and it primarily focuses on this, which is the connective tissue fiber attachment. And it's why we cannot necessarily expect to have the same results or the same forgiveness, if you will, around a dental implant, and why there's so much emphasis on trying to kind of achieve the stability because we are up against 
you know, the worst case scenario, which is that there is not a true connective tissue attachment. The blood supply is compromised, especially at the cortical crest where it's basically avascular. And there is no periodontal ligament to transmit forces. So with all that kind of said, we must appreciate that an implant, when we endeavor into it, of course, is its own unique beast in terms of the way that we approach it. So before I delve in, and we will in just like literally a few minutes, I think there's, there's two really important studies that drive me when I do my cases and that I'm always thinking about. And one goes back to our buddy Dennis again, which everyone is familiar with this one. He's sort of famous for that number five millimeters and not having a papilla or having a papilla. But, you know, it's funny, you know, I, when I look back on this that we had to do in our residency and, you know, it was always, this was always this paper that's the most widely quoted by just about everyone, you know, usually when I read these days, life is busy, I kind of find a topic I like, I get to the, I hope there's pictures, and then I, I read the conclusion and that's kind of the end of my journal reading. But sometimes when you put lectures together like this, you have to actually kind of delve a little bit deeper and look at things to understand why or why not, what would they show. And we know with Dennis, all he was trying to say was if you've got this bone level and I measure interproximally, does this have an impact on whether someone has a papilla? And of course, this was around natural teeth. And in doing this measurement, he kind of said, if you look like this upper person, you're not going to, that you don't count. You're not a full papilla. And if you look like this lower person, you have a full papilla, right? So what does he find? And this is the results. And this is the really, for me, the most important thing because it's a rule with kind of a caveat to it. And everyone says, if you ask them, will you have a papilla if it's greater than five millimeters? They say, no, look at Dennis's paper, 100%, 100%, 98%. Sure, I agree, but did you read further than that? Because if you look at the six millimeter individuals and there was 112 of them, over 50% of them still had full papilla, but we kind of ignore that. We just say, you're not gonna have a papilla, right? And then of course you go into the seven, eight, nines, even a quarter of them at, at those people had a papilla, right? So I think this is important to respect it, but to also understand that we can't just say every person's never gonna have one. It helps us to have an idea of what we're walking into, to set our patient expectations in terms of what we can achieve biologically predictably. And of course, we all wanna have that high percentage of predictability. But I think that really what we get here is an appreciation that sometimes there are certain anatomy or ways that we can kind of get around this. The only other piece I'm gonna to touch on is this before we get into it, which is, again, back to Dennis, he kind of owns this space, is where does this rule come from implants being placed too close or too far? Because I mentioned earlier, well, you shouldn't place them too close or you, you, know, you need to have at least a few millimeters. Again, everyone memorizes that number, like three millimeters or you know, things like this. But we know from his study, and I'm a visual guy, so you know, he took implants that were close and were far and he, leveled, he measured the crest of bone. So how did this work? Well, picture that biologic width and the easiest way is kind of like a Venn diagram, right? So, you know, you get this bone loss that converges. And if the implants are far apart like this, it looks like this. And if the implants are closer together, it looks like this. And it really makes it clear that when you have the bone in between, it will be maintained when they're further apart and they'll be blunted when they kind of converge at a more kind of closer than ideal. And his conclusion, of course, which I quoted at the beginning, was this three millimeter rule that so many people are familiar with. So if you have less than three millimeters, you can expect you know, more bone loss, greater than a millimeter on average. And if you have greater than three millimeters, you get this significant difference of about a half a millimeter, which we work in a millimeter, so we need these advantages at our disposal. So, you know, this is, this kind of came paired with the article and it's this really kind of like, looks like this antique, you know, schematic that it's like, why would you pay any attention to this thing? But it, I always show it. It looks like it was kind of drawn in like, you know, a kid's class, but essentially it shows two teeth and it shows the bony architecture, which has a positive architecture and it shows the CJ in the margins. And then it shows happens even in a rudimentary sense if you have an implant beside it which is that it loses this bone on either side but when you have a natural tooth beside it the bone is still sustained in that area versus when you have two implants beside each other 
you end up in this situation where you have blunting of the interpapillary bone. Now, this does not mean this happens 100% of the time. And it also doesn't mean that if we respect the rules that we may not still get bit even if we keep the implants apart, it can still be a tricky endeavor. So kind of I've overstayed my welcome with the background and now we'll get into the meat, which is the cases. So this is the first case I want to discuss. And, and I love this case because for me, it's an older case. And, and to give you some idea, you know, I graduated in 2011. So I'm certainly, you know, kind of just getting my stride at this stage in the game. And of course, I thought I was the most experienced clinician and gifted clinician in the world when I graduated in 2011. You learn rather quickly. That's not the case. Um, but, you know, this is a case in why documentation is so important because, I mean, man, I, I'm glad I took photos of this. I didn't used to take photos as much. You kind of get out of residency, you're burnt out, and you're like, I just want to pick up my speed and, you know, start paying off those loans. And you don't necessarily want to pick the camera up. But I did take photos of this, and it's a patient who, fortunately, I'm still in touch with today and get her in when I can, you know, about once a year. But when she landed in my chair, the issue was as follows, you know, very classic sort of situation. These are two splinted crowns and they had been falling off constantly. And we see this where patients will kind of glue it on and, you know, or they go back to their dentist. They don't want to take that leap, that jump to actually, um, you know, making the, the, the full tilt change to extractions or to implants. And, and she had kind of gone on long enough where she's at this stage in the game where she's saying, you know, I can't chew, I can't function. It's become kind of, a, it's inhibiting my lifestyle. And I would like to address this in a more definitive fashion. And, you know, what's going on so-called kind of behind the curtain, if you will, because when you look at this, it may or may not kind of allude to something more major being done. You don't necessarily see a ginormous abscess or significant inflammation. But when we look at the simple periapical that was taken, I think we slowly begin to realize and appreciate that something more is indeed happening here. And uh, of course, because these are splinted, it becomes a little bit more of a unique situation. There was no question that the one one, and I love that I'm speaking to someone, you know, not in the rest of the world. I don't have to use the number eight because, uh, you know, unlike the United States, but then the number eight, the one one was obviously beyond restoration. And whereas you may have some argument that it's possible to keep the, uh, the number nine, the two one, uh, you know, this was discussed with the patient and, and people always love to leap both in lectures and in social media and things, you know, why did you do this or why didn't you do this without knowing the conversations that took place. But I can tell you that, you know, we did have discussion with their dentist, with an endodontist, and given the kind of malformed apices and the history of what was a questionable root canal therapy from many years ago, it was really just thought that these two teeth should simply be removed. And again, just like the edentulous situation I showed you at the beginning, well, you can be very straightforward about this. You can say, okay, I place implants. I know how this goes. I'm going to take the two teeth out and I want to place implants. But, you know, is, that, is it that simple? Um, you know, are you going to do this in a delayed fashion. If you're delaying the implant placement, are you doing socket preservation? Does it require an augmentation? Are you doing hard and soft tissue? If you are doing a delayed, are you putting them in a partial denture, a Maryland bonded? Are you making it ovate? You know, are they wearing simply uh, like a flipper, uh, an immediate denture? How long will you wait? All these things start to add up. Do you put the implants in immediately? Well, it looks like a reasonable site to do it in perhaps. If we put them in immediately, are you feeling comfortable temporizing or loading these things? You know, how integral is that to success? Something that I have personally been kind of, um, uh, you know, championing for a lot of years because I, I, that's, that, that was part of my kind of later stage mentorship. But, you know, many people still thinking an immediate approach, you know, is, is risky or is for kind of, uh, you know, people who are, are um, you know, cowboys. But I think now we're starting to see this as something that's almost necessity if you want to reach the highest level. So we'll, we'll delve into this and I'm going to show you in how I carried this out. And there's going to be a couple other cases to follow because remember, we're keeping with this theme of partial edentialism. And as long as it's more than one tooth, we're in that realm. Now here, most would argue that you don't have too many options to choose from. Maybe you'll find the odd person who would say, put one implant and hang a cantilever to avoid having two implants. 
that's not typically the case. So here's the situation, and this is when we most, you know, we easily remove this splendid bridge. Again, no questions asked about the restorability about the, the one one. We talked about the issues with the two one, and the direction and the decision here is to go forth with extraction and implant therapy. Um, when you look at this, you know, we begin to analyze things a lot. And, uh, you know, maybe we make these decisions in our head very quickly as we become more experienced. Sometimes we share these with, with the patients in the chair. Uh, but, you know, they do have what looks to be like a nice band of keratinized tissue. And it's I, certainly for me would kind of fall into that so-called thick biotype type of situation. These are helpful, right? These are helpful things that are going to tell us that we have not necessarily forgiveness, but they may allow us to go in a certain direction, like for instance, immediacy, that otherwise may not be the case. This freedom is something we actually did not really address, but often, you know, it, it may be brought into discussion. Will that have long-term consequence for recession? Will it have an impact? You know, I suppose time will tell. So the decision here is to remove these teeth and simultaneously place dental implants. And I'll walk you through kind of our workflow that takes place pretty routinely in, in our dental office uh, because we, we try and do same day therapy whenever possible for our patient base. So here the teeth have been extracted atraumatically. And uh, you know, people throw that term around atraumatic, but we know how important it is when it comes to setting the stage for even a delayed type of socket preservation where you sustain the bone or maintain the bone. And then of course, if you're trying to place implants immediately, it becomes even more paramount. And uh, you know, we do this without raising a flap, without taking a blade, and uh, you know, oftentimes we really try and leave things exactly as was when we entered into the case. And I think that that's so kind of crucial in order to, to gain the type of uh, outcomes that we really want in our patient's desire. So here's the situation from the occlusal view. And when we look at this, you can see that it looks at least like we have a number of factors again working towards us in terms of the gingival thickness. Um, you know, it, that contour has been maintained. Uh, you know, I can only tell you from my experience of being the operator in the chair that the, the, the bony housing was intact. This was not a case where there's, there's a, you know, there's no, uh, there's no buckle plate. The buckle plate was intact and the teeth are, are kind of, we're almost in a slightly buckly displaced position. And this is very important because when we're placing immediate implants or any implants for that matter, we all go on and on about this need or this necessity for so-called prosthetically driven placement. And here we need to focus largely on placement in the palatal or the cingulum area in order to not only gain stability in the palatal bone, which has that denser kind of you know, ability to, to gain higher torques, but also to go beyond that we want to make sure that we're in a situation where we can have screw retention. And I think that almost everyone has come to agreement. The consensus is sort of out that that is the direction that you should head. And, you know, for, for uh, go to any Congress, any symposium, and, and you're going to hear people talking in the same fashion that I am. We're all kind of speaking the same language. I think at this stage, that's not to say that it won't evolve and change over time, but that's kind of a, the, the climate at this moment. So two implants are placed and I've done my best here to place them at appropriate depth and, and an appropriate palatal position. And you'll see in just a second, the way that we move from here, but you can see the, the, you know, the attention, the cleanliness that we're trying to kind of obtain here. We're trying to maintain. And here we are using, uh, these are temporary copings. We actually use very commonly, um, these are, these are actually not, particularly designed for this. There are titanium abutments with many individuals will use. Uh, we had used these, these are peak uh, abutments. And they're actually a lab, uh, a lab component, but we found it to be quite nice in terms of use. And one of the mentalities being that it doesn't, it's a connection, but it has some degree of give. And our thought was that when patients don't comply or when they chew and they eat, in spite of us telling them not to following temporization, that we'd rather the temporary come loose then the, the forces be transmitted to the implant. And whether there's any merit to that, we've kind of started to move, move to titanium recently, but this was our thought process at the time because this case dates back about seven years now. So um, there's Tempel. 
we have a, we're very fortunate to have a lab that works within our practice. It's a full scale lab for full arch and for single type of implant therapy. And these are, this is a resin fabricated temporary. Uh, this is not made out of acrylic. It's a, it's a material called Radica and they create these shells. Now we don't do probably as much true guidance as we should. We're, we're kind of late to that game in that respect. And we're getting there as ridiculous as that sounds. But I think that anyone who has experience will tell you that as long as you have some form of guidance, that's what really matters, right? So when we go into our surgeries, we have one of these shells for every case that we do. And I think that's so important because this is telling me where these implants should be, whether it's done through a computer, you know, facilitated guidance or a dynamic guidance, or really just this kind of static guidance. It is just fine because I'm coming up where I need to be. And here I'm just showing that, of course, it looks like I've done a slightly better job on the one one than on the two one, but you can see that we're in a harmonious position for restoration. Now, this is a slide I'm going to double back to because I think this is where a lot of conversation will come into play, which is that I didn't leave this patient in healing abutments. These healing abutments are simply placed at the time of me condensing my graft material into the bone implant void. And you know, there are lectures and, and, and um, you know, uh, congresses that just surround this discussion of how to manage the bone implant void because it is this like both simple but sophisticated kind of endeavor that depends on the patient and the clinician and all these things. So at this stage in the game, what I was using here was BioOS. And it's a, this was a small particle BioOS and you can see that I've condensed these particles basically up to the margin of the gingiva. And I will tell you completely honestly that when I was doing this almost a decade ago, I was not aware of what, of course, comes further down the road, this dual zone theory that is very, very popular, and we'll touch on that, but I was not aware of that. And my thought process wasn't that I was trying to do like vertical ridge augmentation, I was a realist. I just thought I want to put in as much as possible because some may come out and maybe it'll help to thicken things. And you know, I'm just trying to mask things. I'm not trying to get into relation to the healing abutments or to the resin. I'm simply just trying to get the best case scenario and kind of overpack the area. So we'll, we'll kind of go back to that. But here's the implants placed. And this is at the time of placement. I've done a reasonable job um, to be noted. And I think this is another growing you know, area of popularity is that these are narrow platform implants, something that, you know, long ago we put in the biggest, fattest, widest, you know, implants we could and just crunch them into the socket to get stability. And oftentimes we know that those were buckly displaced because they followed the root form of a tooth, which usually is not in the desirable Powell position. And so here I've used narrow. I've done that for an array of reasons. I want them to be as spaced apart as possible for the reasons we discussed at the beginning. And uh, we know that with today's technology, that narrower platform dip plants by almost every type of manufacturer have the strength and mechanical properties to sustain this type of thing. We don't just have to use them for mandibular incisors or maxillary lateral incisors. So here's the narrow platform implants. Here is the case, screw retained, back from the laboratory. And, you know, here's the patient's lips in repose, which is always a nice way to show it. But, uh, you know, you can see the natural blend. You can also notice that the, that the, central, uh, the central incisor uh, edges are slightly shorter or cut back than the other areas because we're trying to keep them out of protrusion and out of occlusion and think this, depending on the patient situation. Now, you'll notice there's a slight... Uh, asymmetry here. This is how the patient came in. They were unaware of that. This is how the patient sort of wanted to stay. And we told them that, you know, if anything, with time, with conditioning, we can change this as long as our implants are at a suitable depth. The, let's see what the body does. I'd rather not start doing, you know, gingivectomy crown lengthenings. I can't go back from that. I'd rather see where I land and have the ability to simply change the contour of the tooth in order to kind of die back the gum margins and make them symmetrical. So that's what was done. Now, here's the patient at five years. And again, back to, you know, complicated cases that you asked for. I don't, this does and doesn't fit the bill per se, but there is a nuance to this. And when I look at this, I think, you know what, it's a pretty good looking result. I don't think that people would recognize that they're implants. Is it like the most aesthetic, most beautiful, look at this gorgeous, you know, perhaps you know, it, it, it's solid. 
the patient is of course pleased. I'm pleased for me. I work in a, you know, very realistic world. I, yeah, I'm a high volume kind of guy, but this is, this is considered satisfactory in my practice. And certainly she was pleased. And, you know, just to go back, cause this is where you start to dissect things and look at things and gain more from it. So for starters, we put the implants and I want to show you, this is kind of interesting, the evolution of this interpapillary bone, because this is what, what comes ha what happens. So here we are placed. And here we are at the time of temporization. And you can see it looks at least, and maybe it's the lucency as we'll note later, but in spite of my best efforts, narrow platform implants, putting the implants a few millimeter apart, you know, implants are parallel, everything's done right here. Uh, and it looks like we're losing a little bit of that kind of interpapillary bone or that, that interproximal bone between the implants in spite of our best efforts. But what's even more important that I'd like to note is look at the bone between the implants in the teeth and why we have that forgiveness. Remember that really kind of antiquated schematic that I showed us where it says that the bone kind of holds onto it. And we know there's literature to show that this um, from Joe Kahn and his group that say that it's really the, the interproximal bone at the level of the tooth that is gonna dictate where the papilla is gonna fall or where that bone level, it's gonna have that kind of angulation. So here's this, these implants five years later, uh, and you can actually see the interproximal bone, you know, whether it just was not showing in that initial image. Um, you know, here's the situation here. Uh, and uh, I want to go back to this because I think this is the essence. This is such an important talking point. You know, what do you put in your bone implant voids? And we can, and we can chat about this at the end if you want even more so, because I think it's a good one. But I had gone back and forth between xenograft and allograft and back to xenograft and all these things. And of course, depending on the part of the world that you practice in, you may only have certain products accessible. Uh, you know, in Europe, they don't have allograft materials. I don't know if that's similar um, in Tehran, but basically we have all of these at our disposal and it becomes a bit of a, an idea of how you go back and forth with this. Sometimes these particles can pose issue in the healing and I found them to kind of exfoliate through. And uh, again, maybe we'll discuss this at the end, but there, there, I've seen pros and cons that come with different types of uh, materials in this area. But I think it's important that this is something that is stressed that I pretty much always graft in the bone implant void something. Uh, I think that jury is kind of out because in spite of you know, jumping distances and palantonios and all this stuff, you know, for me, I'm not going to chance that the clot is going to stabilize. I want to sustain things. I want to have that big kind of, uh, you know, nice, uh, thorough kind of situation. Now, I was very lucky. I dragged this patient, you know, every time I give uh, a lecture and I love to include her case or I, it reminds me time to bring her back. And, you know, I did something that perhaps was like a little bit faux pas. I said to her, listen, I'm going to, I really would like to take this off. I got to look underneath and see what it looks like. And, and most people will tell you you're crazy for doing that because we know how, you know, fickle the, the connection is. And when you take it on and off more so you can tamper with it. But uh, this is the situation, good buckle kind of situation. And obviously this looks good. You can see the papilla is a little bit blunted. I mean, it's, it's nicer around the laterals than it is at the midline. I mean, that's the reality. And it's not a huge deal, but we know that getting a more robust papilla between implants is very difficult. Now this is the so-called money shot and makes me happy that I bring her in seven years later and take this thing off. I'll never do it again because now I never want to see what else is going on underneath there. I've got the image that I want, right? We're all happy. So this is what it's all about. And, and, and this, this for me, of course, brings a smile to my face. We all like to boast and show these images. And you can really see kind of the, the I believe that these tissues, you know, it would be very challenging to create this, not that you couldn't do it, starting from a delayed standpoint. I think that immediacy was very crucial here keeping and sustaining the architecture right out of the gate, as opposed to letting it collapse and then having to reconstruct these papilla. You can do it retroactively through temporization and conditioning. You know, many people have shown it, but this is, I think, kind of the, the way to go. And this is just showing the, the, uh, the teeth in place. And here she is seven years later and things are quite stable and, and we're happy. So uh, this is kind of this whole situation. So this was an example of a case that is partial edentulism, but it falls into essentially just one situation you couldn't do anything and i want to kind of swivel and try and sneak at least one more case in here to make good on the discussion of everything um which is this case here and this is an interesting one because when you look at it at first as i did 
I actually didn't think there was anything to do here. I didn't understand why it's the, the consultation says to remove all of her maxillary incisors. And I look at the gums and I look at the health of things and it, it looks pretty solid. I'm confused at what I'm doing, but uh, there are some things that are important to note. When you look at these clinical images, she does have some small black triangles. There is an asymmetry. There is a cant where she's showing more display on the right. There's this diastema between the 2-2 and the 2-3. There's recession on the 2-2. You know, all these things that get chunked into your mind that need to be discussed with the patient. And, you know, how can we improve, change, or at least maintain this? this is her, these are her, her x-rays. And they were pretty shocking to me. I was surprised that the clinical image looked like this. But this goes back to that Tarnow study. She's one of these people who probably had like nine millimeters to the bone, but pretty much still has inter, you know, has interproximal pillow. And so it, this is really kind of key. Now we're going to go through a similar workflow, but again, showing and advocating the type of treatments that we did before. Here, the teeth are taken out atraumatically. It has that nice thick biotype, which we know is so important. Now, how do I tackle this? It becomes like that first, first case that I showed us at the beginning, where we said that, you know, I like to put the implants in the laterals. And here, I'm going to kind of show you why. So implants are placed immediately in the laterals. And, you know, we create or have the lab create this four unit bridge. You can see there is a degree of blanching taking place on the centrals because we're trying to create these ovate situations. We're trying to already capture this situation out of the gate. And what's very interesting to me is that the 2-2 the two -two had a significant amount of recession. And we told her out of the gate that we're gonna try and, and rectify this, but it may not happen. Now, how did I do that? I know there are many who would advocate coronal advancement of flaps, throw in some soft tissue augmentation, I have taken a very different approach to these cases. When the implant is placed in a palatal appropriate position, much like uh, you know, a tooth that orthodontically was tip buckly and then you put it back in the right position, the gums will typically move kind of um, uh, incisally. That's sort of what we did. And you can see we've cut back the temporary in that area or made it shorter at the margin. Now here's how she comes back in a few months later. And we're, you know, we're really happy. Uh, the, probably the most uh, exceptional part of this is the central incisors, because here you can see this situation where, you know, they look like they're truly emerging. And yes, maybe the lateral on the, on the left is a little bit longer, but she doesn't mind it. We don't mind it. And this is what it's all about. And, you know, if we had put four implants in this situation, I really don't think it would have been possible to get this type of maintenance if we didn't do immediate temporization I don't think that we would have been able to get this type of outcome. And you know, this is the type of image that I think as periodontists, as dentists, we could stare at this all day because when we talk about these words like coral pink and knife edge papilla, I mean, really look at this image and appreciate that I think that if you did it in delayed fashion, this, this would not be uh, you know, a, a possible thing to kind of to achieve. And so this is kind of the before and after I would from the day of surgery to, you know, uh, the time of final restoration. And one thing that I kind of think is interesting is if you look at this lateral, you can actually see this kind of slightly immature epithelium at the margin has kind of just grown in by a couple of millimeters. And that's encouraging. That's kind of, we did manage to get a little, achieve a little bit of that migration that I was referring to. So here's the implants four years later. And you know, some might debate or say that there's you know, some degree of bone loss here. Uh, you know, for me, when the tissues look like that, it doesn't get me perturbed. And I think that that's kind of key. So I think back to my buddy Dennis and this not wanting to lose it and reform it. I wanna keep it and never let it go is something that he says. And that, that's kind of key. So what happens if you place four implants together? And this is a, not my case, and everyone loves to say that when it's not theirs, but I need to show the other side of things. And this is a case of someone who had four implants in our practice by another surgeon who was working under a difficult situation. And this is, you know, this is the outcome. And, and these are the kind of challenges that we don't want to end up in. And you can see how difficult it is to resurrect this. They've tried everything from tissue conditioning to temporization. And really, th these in lie the challenges. So you know, we don't want to be on the other end with this sort of, a, of an outcome. I think that's kind of key. And uh, again, 
talking about before I mentioned about Joseph Kahn saying that the, the bone levels or the papilla will always be better between the implant and the tooth. So I'm going to wrap up with this one last case, try and shove it in here in the last five minutes that I have, because um, they all circulate around the same thing. And look at this one with this midline. And that's, this is a, a partial denture this patient is wearing because her bridge has already broken and fallen off. Now, am I going to put the two implants right beside each other in the central and lateral? Like, I, no, I don't want to do that. That's, that's going to end up with a less than ideal outcome. So here's her situation. And this is her kind of smiling. And she has some advantages. The papilla is not really in the right place, but she has this really long papilla that's almost overhanging beyond her lips. So we have this kind of excess of tissue to work with. And again, we go back to the same formula here with immediacy, a not so great kind of photo where I had to kind of, uh, you know, actually excise things and trim things to make them fit. And here's the implants temporized. Here's the implants of four months. And we're a little concerned because at four months, I see a little bit of dieback. And some could argue that's normal. It's not normal. It depends on, on different things. But, um, you know, this is what it looks like. And here she is smiling. Now, the midline has been aligned. These are the temporaries. They don't look fantastic here, but she's thrilled on what she was in. And we're kind of moving along. Here she is a year later. And, you know, again, everyone's threshold for what is bone loss is different. But when it looks like this, I don't really get up in arms, especially when a couple of years later, it looks like this and it hasn't budged. It's kind of staying stable. And part of the reason it's probably staying stable is that this is the final outcome. And this is the occlusal. You can see they're screw retained as we've discussed. And this is the tissue. And you know, if, for people who get excited about that degree of bone loss, I would welcome them to look at this. And again, that pontic, that new kind of mesializing of things in order to make it more harmonious. This is really what it's kind of all about and why I think temporization is so key. So back to our original discussion, what's the topic immediate temporization, credentialism, for me, they kind of come part and parcel in terms of being like, you know, inextricably intertwined. So this is the type of tissues, obviously, we're, we're really wanting to try and achieve. And this is kind of just showing the, the overall circumstance at the end. So, you know, how can we minimize bone loss uh, and papillary blunting? I, I think it sort of comes down to this idea is it the arrow or the archer? And I think that I showed a lot of the surgical aspects of what I think are important in terms of treatment planning and how to do things. But I think it is worth just gently touching on some of the things that are, are, are out there or have been out there because I'm always looking for new things. And I think that the implant does matter, not like the specific manufacturer, not like the brand per se, but things like whether an implant has a basic platform shift, uh, you know, the connection, the seal, the, the way it is at the coronal portion, these are all key. And we've seen so many different companies to market with these ideas like the laser lock, uh, the on one, uh, you know, this scalloped implant that existed before my time, the Nobel perfect, because they were trying to kind of create that same, uh, you know, emergence and, and idea of the, of a, of a tooth. And then Southern has come up with this invert, invert, I think, implant. It's, it's wide and then kind of narrow at the top so you can still get stability but not be as close as an offset. I mean, there's so much going on. And I think the other is surfacing, which is a huge thing, I think. And now everyone's always been on board with, with Strawman with their SLA Active and how key that is. And now uh, personally excited to be, you know, I place both of these implants, but be excited to be using this uh, new um, uh, Thai Ultra Surface and, and their componentry from Nobel. It's, it's nice to see this kind of uh, innovation, if you will, trying to kind of stem or push things forward. And I'll just kind of close with this case because I always laugh at it. It goes back to my residency. It's not a great image like some of the other ones, but you know, sometimes we have to think outside the box. And as much as we would have loved to maybe gone ahead and done block grafting and all these different things to kind of facilitate uh, an, a, an aesthetic outcome for this patient, when all else fails, sometimes we can actually go ahead and, and even resort to things like pink porcelain. And, you know, of course, after five seconds, our eyes all adjust and we see what's going on. But this was a case that was initially crown lengthened and then just done with a couple of implants, no augmentation, 
Of course, these have their own hygiene issues and things like that. But this is a patient who had been searching the earth not to take bone from their hip at the time and all these things. And we did it in one surgery kind of situation. It's nice to kind of think outside the box. So, I mean, that's kind of uh, my thing. And, and I told you I love quotations. This is not my quote, but it's from Maya Angelou. And it's a very, a lot of people use it, I think. It simply just says, do the best you can until you better. And then when you know better, do better. And I think that, you know, it's tough to keep up with dentistry. It's so innovative. But part of the reason that I was excited to come on to this platform and talk is that, you know, this is how we learn when we're, whether we're the ones lecturing or we're the ones receiving the lecture, we're forced to, to, you know, push forward to hear and listen and be open-minded to new innovation. And I think that that's such a crucial component to so-called lifelong learning that many of us claim we're going to do, but never do. So I just kind of want to leave with that. And if I guess I could wrap some conclusions up, you know, keep your just implants a little further apart. The bone can dictate the soft tissue condition. Of course, we hear that, you know, the bone sets the tone, but sometimes we can prevail and some maybe sometimes do even better than expected. You know, we can be those people, those outliers in the Tarnow study or using temporization or using good implant placement. And, uh, you know, more implants isn't always better. Maybe, maybe for the bank book, not necessarily for the aesthetic. And uh, maintenance of papilla we know is challenging. And, and don't think that teeth and implants are the same. That, that's a big one, right? So uh, I guess with that, I'll do a quick thing. Thank you. I think we're, we're on point with the time. And then uh, I'll, I'll just kind of turn this, I'll stop sharing my screen over, then we can just uh, have a little casual banter and you can roast me as you, as you see fit. Thanks, Phil. I have to say, you know, first of all, I want to thank you because you were so specific on the topic. And I think it's a great way to start a discussion and people learn a point during each presentation and I think it's very valuable. So I thank you for being focused on that amazing, interesting topic, which also is one of my favorites, the papilla. And you know, um, I wanna start up this way. Your first case that you presented, it was back in your, I think, post-grad program, as you mentioned, the two centrals. And you showed the first step of provisionalization and you showed that the right one, the tooth number eight, had a shorter crown length comparing to nine. And your, in your follow-ups, it was like, yep. it was comparable to each other. So the gingiva in the tooth number eight, the implant number eight, moved apically a bit. I mean, like one or one and a half millimeters. So I wanna ask you this. I mean, yep. we know, but just to make it more clear for the audience of our uh, hot seat, why do you think that happened? Is it something that we can always rely on and with predicted or did you find anything special in your procedure that made that happen, that one and a half millimeters going apically? Yeah, I mean, listen, it's, it's a great question. When you want to talk about specifics, that's a wonderful kind of, I mean, this is all about nitpicking is how we kind of learn this stuff. So I'll tell you, I'll give kind of two pieces to that answer. I'll talk to what we did in that specific situation, which I had left out, but then I'll also kind of discuss general idea of what can happen. We know that in it, generally speaking, that there can be, you know, a half a millimeter, a millimeter, a millimeter and a half of recession that can take place around dental implants falling placements. And, you know, I hate to kind of throw things out, but, uh, you know, Joe can has a wonderful paper on this and he talks about one of the biggest drivers of that being tissue thickness and he so-called divides these patients into like a thin and a thick tissue biotype those where the the had the thicker tissue biotype they only lost like a half a millimeter but those who had a thinner biotype they lost a millimeter and a half and you know i don't know if this is the direction you're heading with this but there are many and I speak to lots who, who do soft tissue augmentation for every single one of these cases to avert that from happening. And I may be growing towards that. I think part of it is experience. Part of it is, you know, of course you want to do right by the patient, but then you start throwing in multiple surgeries, even if we do them well, that sometimes people are kind of turned off of things. That's not the right thing to do, but I've had good success with the dual zone. Why we had the specific recession in this case was it was actually controlled. And at the beginning, I mentioned to you that I simply said to the patient, as opposed to me excising the gums and doing this, 
why don't we see a what the body does or not hers actually did not recede and it may have been a biologic width thing between the two teeth who knows what it was all we did and what we do very routinely and i have you know many other discussions on this also a hot topic is you know emergence profile and the contour and you know the the so-called critical and subcritical contours that come with with implant restorations so we are just actually driving this up a hair by bulking up the buckle portion at the margin a fraction and we'll do this over a period of time where we'll come in we'll have the lab take a look they'll add a little bit you know uh, they may even use a pencil mark of the existing one they'll add a little bit then we'll put it back in with some pressure it'll blanch we know we've just done it and then we'll tell the patient to come back and let four to six weeks and we'll just take a look at it and it, we can just very controlled kind of drive it up the same way as that lateral incisor that i showed in the case with the four implants by putting it set back and cutting back the emergence we actually could drive it down i think these are pretty kind of well uh you know more well known things now but a lot of the stuff that i was doing then i gotta be honest was just on intuition and it, it's exciting that it is kind of main ground at this point in time yeah, you know, you know, that was interesting that you also talked about the contouring and its effect on uh, pushing the gingiva going apically or bring it back like the one that you mentioned in the latter case. But, you know, what I also thought in, about your case was the, the, the depth of placement of those implants adjacent to each other. Because as I remember, the number eight was a bit more superficial to compare it to number nine. And maybe that's why the soft tissue also yep. receded about a millimeter. And that was the point to make because we wanted to have comparable crowns. And I think, um, I think clinicians can take this one to consideration that maybe with playing with different levels of implants, they can achieve the predictable results. But my next question is this. In the static zone specifically, when you want to restore four anterior teeth, no matter if you want to place two implants in the laterals, one in the lateral, one in the central, or two in the central. Do you always think that you should place those two implants at the same level regarding the depth? Or do you have any concern if placing them in different levels? Yeah, I think it's... Good points, and I like what how you I, something actually have that with regard to the case that you mentioned, and I guess it goes back to that biologic width conversation in a way, right? Because where you put that in yeah. will determine to a degree the the, heart, the soft tissue. Um, I, I think that um, as perfectionists, as dentists, as guys who have our work on display, we always love when we use and we joke in my practice, like when we're doing multiples, we want them to be like the same diameter, the same length, for no other reason. And that we're vain and we're crazy and we're OCD is up on the radiograph. So I think, you know, placing the implants at the same level in an ideal world makes sense depth wise, except when it doesn't, because if the bone levels are disparate or different, you know, you may not be able to put them in the same position or if the, the gingival levels are different levels. So I think, you know, in theory, in idealism, would I like to put my implants at the same level with the hopeful outcome that then the overarching heart and issues will be at the same level sure a necessity i don't think so because you know we have play with the type of abutments that we use and the emergence that we use on each of these in order to kind of uh, kind of change slightly these cases but i think that uh you know you try to but it's not it's not a must and do you do you always go with the screw retain restorations in the anterior zone or it depends on your case i mean putting the screw retained versus semen retain restorations. So for us, and you know, it's funny, everything I think works in cycles, what's new is old sort of thing. Of course, you know, it was screw retained forever with the, and then it became cement retained, I think as a result of like kind of the mish kind of push. And then now I think, you know, starting maybe some seven years ago, like I give a discussion on cement retained, um, I don't know if you know, uh, like Dr. Chandra Wadwani, who's kind of like, he's a huge champion of screw retention and is really exposed, right? Of course, you know, his practice is called Cementless in Seattle. And uh, he kind of got me intrigued in the idea of it. And, and really, because as a periodontist, of course, we see the sequelae that come from residual excess cement. Now, that's not to say 
uh, at a very, very high level. There aren't some individuals who may be able to achieve success with cement retention, but more and more evidence is showing us. You look at Tom uh, uh, Linkovicus and his group who are coming out with more and more and more with their zero bone loss concepts and building and saying like, even if you think you removed it all, you probably have it. Even if you're using a rubber dam, even if you're using a, you know, radio opaque, it's very challenging. And we know that it, it's not tissue friendly and it can cause issue. So I guess in answer to your question, whenever possible, I am trying to do screw retain because it's retrievable, especially because we're temporizing things and we want that luxury to take it on and off and, and, play with the with the tissues and the contours and of course if there's issues down the road where a patient is displeased with the aesthetics or, or selling chips you know we all know the first question I ask when someone comes to my chair or as a referral and they say will you check to see what's going on with this implant you may have to take the crown off is like I want to know if it's cement or screw retained because I know it's going to be make my life so much easier to service the thing um, and I think that the window for uh, cement retained is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller whereas I used to say you know, there are situations where, uh, you know, the bone simply doesn't allow or the anatomy simply doesn't allow. And I, you know, I tried my best and I didn't want to do augmentation. But now with these ASC, it's like the angulated screw channels that pretty much every company has, we have this ability usually to have it like about a 25 degree offset. So, you know, again, and that's a huge amount of, of, uh, of compensation in that area of the mouth. So, is it possible to do cement retained when all else fails and do it as diligently as you can, but when possible, especially if you plan properly, have some degree of guidance and then, you know, with these compensatory mechanisms, if need be, I, I favor trying to do screw retain whenever possible. Yeah. And do you have any specific criteria for immediate provisionalization of your cases? regarding, you know, I mean, I mean, the ISQ insertion torque value, do you have any criteria specifically or, you know, it depends on the case? I, yeah, I, I think it, it definitely is case by case. I, I hate to say like we, I know it, it's nice to have goals. I, you know, I think that what it comes down to is for good and for bad, our practice is very built and driven on immediacy. And a lot of our referring dogs or patients who come see us directly, they're coming with the notion that they're getting teeth the same day. Now, we don't want to put them at risk. We want to give them good long term. But because of that expectation, I think that we do push the envelope a little bit more than others. And I think that with that comes even, you know, I, I can feel comfortable saying we may have a slightly higher failure. Everyone boasts, you know, 98%. But we're proud of the work that we do. Part of that comes in circumstances where we will load things or temporize things under less than ideal circumstances. And by that, I mean, you know, everyone may say 35, 40 Newton centimeters, et cetera, you know, an ISQ of 65, 70, whatever objective criteria they want to have, and then say, nope, that's my kind of cutoff line. And then if I don't get that, forget about it, sorry. But I can tell you from experience that shockingly, although I may know some of the ones are going to fail when I like load it when it's almost a spinner, um, but you know, but th there's there's many that you'd be surprised that they do incredibly well in spite of us. And it's certainly when it comes to full arch situation, which is a very different beast, but we'll joke amongst the surgeons at our practice that, you know, we just had a case where all the implants together added up to 35 and, you know, we kind of went for it. And uh, with that cross arch stabilization, you're to do it with singles. It's a little more finicky. I think we'll just move to make sure that the temporary is just that much shorter, that much more out of occlusion and things like that. But we, we don't have a set criteria. In general, tighter is better. And we just go for higher insertion torques. That's kind of just the, the motto that we live by. Um, and we may have to have conversations with the patients in the chair because we will, I will often, you know, surgically sit the patient up and say to them, like, you know, your bone was not as of good quality as we anticipated. Uh, you know, the implant did not go in as tight as I would love it to have. And I believe that putting a tooth on today, although something that you want, may be longevity of this implant, and you may have a higher chance of an implant failure. Do you want to do the safe thing, which I would recommend if there was no human being attached to the, you know, if, if there was no person emotion attached to this, uh, and put a, you know, a cover screw or a healing abutment on, or do you want to chance it and really be on your bed? You'll get everything. I have patients who say, I need it in. Like I just can't be without a tooth or I can't. And, and we do, we typically, 
typically will convert the, when possible, we'll convert the shell if we can't do it into a Maryland because we have the luxury of having the lab there. So most of the times we're doing somewhat something fixed, which some of the, you know, uh, nervousness or anxiety out of it, but those are, those are dicey. I mean, people bite into them the wrong way, especially the interior, not enough over jet, you know, and they pop off and it just becomes a nightmare. So we, we try and temporize whenever possible within so-called reason. We're definitely on the aggressive end. We don't have like a bottom a Newton centimeter or something like this where we just say, forget about it. But uh, it's, there's no strict, unfortunately, objective criteria I can offer you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your experience also, because uh, I really got the point because some, some people really insist on having a very high insertion torque or ice cube, but you know, it happens, you know, I think it's clinical expertise and experience and skills is also uh, important in this field. And Phil, I have a question for all of my guests in Hot Seat Season 3. And really, I really, I'm really interested to know your answers. And that's this. Do you think that practitioners around the world these days, not all of them, but some of them, are doing over-treatment for their patients? Do you believe in that or no? Because, you know, Sometimes, sometimes we see that the patient demands is only having a tooth and, you know, they really don't want to touch other teeth and they really, I'm not going to say they don't want a perfect smile, but sometimes they don't have the, the time maybe, or maybe from the financial point of view, or, you know, we can always do things perfect. But when we, when we see posts on Instagrams, on social media, sometimes we see that every steps are in a perfectionist way but do you think it's over treatment for patients around the world in the hands of clinicians or you think all of those steps are necessary for the patients so i i don't know you know it's hard to call so i had uh, this is a, a really i think it's a great question because it beckons so much more kind of like you know, beyond ethics or anything like that, there, there is a personal element to this. And it's funny, I am, it's kind of like in politics where you could like someone, but they may have a totally different political view. I think sometimes when we look at these kind of point counterpoint sessions where you see a guy like a Danny Boozer, who's like classic grafting. And then if someone talks about, you know, immediacy, he, it's like, it turns into a bar fight. Um, and I, I, I am on the end of like doing like, uh, within reason. And that's a huge piece because I really, you know, patients come to me as a second opinion often as they were told they need a gum graft and a bone, another bone graft and another gum graft and, you know, this and that. And I'm like, well, I can give you a tooth in a day. That's pretty good. <laughs> like, you know, like, like that, that's kind of, and like, I'm not really going to take bone from your jaw or anything. And you know, it's, it's funny though, because I think I'm being a good guy for doing it, but then there will be people who will say, you're taking shortcuts, it's under, it's not going to last in the long term, etc. And you know what, sometimes they may be right. I, I don't know. I'm not such a polarized person. I've long become much more open to different modalities because I appreciate that there's conversations that take place with patients. There's conversations or, or mentalities and training and background, but ultimately it's wrong and I wouldn't call it over treatment for those that do a connective tissue graph for every single case of whatever for every single case of this for every single case that's what they believe in they were taught it's what they have experience with it's what they you know kind of sleep well at night doing um and for me I kind of trade that off with the fact that I know that largely getting good outcomes and really satisfied patients who I'm providing like I don't I don't know if you know um Gabor Tepper who is uh, you know, a big strawman guy in Vienna. And he's like further on the other, even more on my end of the spectrum than I am, but he's like on, he calls it a crusade where everyone who's doing sinus lifts and grafting and whatever, it's all, it's all crazy, it's over treatment. You, know, you, you can just put implants in and they work. I don't know if I go quite that far. I love, love him, but uh, I, I am somewhere in between the two in terms of the way that I approach things. I think you do need some adjunctive procedures. And then, like you said, it's often case by case. That's why I don't like it. So, you know, some guys do connective tissue graphs for every case, just to, for insurance, you know, to make sure it, is that necessary? Biotype? I don't know, right? Like, it's like, those are the things that we need to kind of consider. I think it's a wonderful 
kind of true personal question, not just like a dental, you do this treatment. And I, I'm glad that you're, you're at to others and I hope you're getting great answers about it. But uh, I think it is part of it is also striving for perfection, as you mentioned. Uh, yeah. The question is, are we trying to achieve perfect for ourselves or for the patients? You know, you know, and my question was really relates to your final case because you really beautifully managed that case with the pink porcelain. You could have done, you know, so many grafting, as you said, so many bone grafts, soft tissue grafts, so many provisionals. But, you know, with, with two or three implants and a pink porcelain and provisional or final restoration, the patient is also happy and you did it fast. And maybe the patient demand was not that high, even if she's not or he's not gummy a smile. So I think that that step of procedure really worked great. So my question was really re relate to that kind of procedures. And, you know, I think your answer, you know, sure. I, I was totally agree with your answer because I think in most of the cases, really, it's not necessary to do so many procedures on a patient. Maybe it just the, re the only reason it's come to my mind is to do a great documentation to present the case. But if you don't want to present the case, I think it can work in a day. Yeah. So thanks, Phil. Yeah, I'm with you. So I, I'm on that. I'm on that end. No yeah. problem. I want to thank you so much again for for giving us your time and your valuable experience. I really enjoyed talking with you and really hope to see you soon in person. And any final words because our time is up and I have to say really again, thank you for yeah, I mean, Thank you for joining. Yeah, well, again, I just, I, I honestly appreciate you. It's funny when you go into these circumstances, we have never met each other. You don't know what, to expect how will it align with the person will you enjoy the conversation will it be just kind of and, and of course this has definitely lived up to the the expectation it was not only you know uh, um, uh, kind of learning for me but it's it's fun it's fun and it's it's really cool to connect with colleagues I think from all over the world and the only thing that hopefully goes beyond this is like I told you now now I have to be on one of these you know amazing uh, amazing excursions that you go on as opposed to just sitting here in my office at uh, at my home to sing with you so I, I know that our paths will cross in future i'm glad that we were able to make each other's acquaintance i hope everything where you are is getting safer and and you and your family are healthy because uh we're, we're in like a weird situation where we're sort of still on lockdown not everyone's vaccinated it's uh it's not um but uh you know i i wish you guys obviously health and safety over there and, and hopefully when this all dies down it'll be a figment of our imagination a couple of years from now the world reopens and there's some exciting endeavors that can exist for everyone yeah sure sure looking forward to that hats off my friend and thank you again for your time stay safe and hope to see you very soon thank you yeah okay take care.